Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Let's dive into today's conversation regarding life's myriad transitions and how we refine our responses in our relationships, our wellness, our households, our work, and in our practices. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have a highly anticipated interview today with a guest who is committing her life to helping parents be better. Her name is Abigail Wald. Welcome to the podcast, my dear. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. I am so grateful. Yeah, very happy you're here. Um, Parents come to you when they are tired of getting pushed past their breaking point. Um, They're ready to like their highly sensitive, strong-willed kids as much as they love them. They come to you when they're sort of at their wit's end. Um, You have a beautiful uh, course called the Transformation Team Project, which is a six-month training for parents. I want to read the subtext. Rise above behavior and circumstance and create the life you want for yourself and your children without apology. So that's saying a lot. Um, you have podcasts uh, that have had more than a million downloads, and that's such a good feeling. And your MFA mentorship project, this is the one I just read about, has helped many hundreds of families optimize uh, their relationships with their kids. So I think I want to start with how this all came to be. How did you land on this very specific um, niche? And we'll go from there. Sure. Well, it happened when I was very, very, very young. (laughs) So when I was about mm, four or five, I remember looking around at the grownups and thinking like, huh, why don't they see those things? And so like in that movie with Bruce Willis called The Sixth Sense, and the kid says, I see dead people. So I weirdly see things that should be invisible. And like I see an order to relationships and harmony. Um, I don't know if it's my triple Libra self, but I just see lines. And then I would see people cross over them the way you would see people on a highway, like cross over a median. And you'd be like, no, that's a bad idea. (laughs) Totally. (laughs) And so... I could just see things. And it always struck me as so odd that these grownups around me couldn't seem to see them. Do you know what I mean by this? I do. I have a certain experience of my own along these lines, but I want you to continue. I don't want to get sidetracked. You know, I had very strong feelings of what was supposed to be there, you know, in the lines of there's our expectation and then there's our reality, right? And I was very clear that I had this expectation, but it wasn't just an expectation. It was like a deep vision. And it it didn't even feel just like a deep vision. It felt like a promise and a mission. And so there was this sense of what family could be, should be, what I needed, what my mom needed. Like I looked at her and I thought, wow, there's so many things that I feel like you should have, but I can't give to you. And why don't you Mm -hmm. have these? Like, I just, I couldn't understand. I couldn't make sense of the puzzle of the world, if that makes sense. Yeah. And completely. And then I was looking at her and I had this very strong sense of what things should be. And I call it the silent promise. So once I had my own children, I was acutely aware that I had this silent promise software running through my body. And what it told me was, these are all the things from your childhood that you want to pass on. Like my family had a love of food and like, so food is a way of love and nurture and the sensuality of it really is a very strong thing running through my veins. And then there were all these things that I didn't want to pass on, right? All the things of like, 
when I'm a parent, I will never feel the way she felt. When I'm a parent, my child will never look at me the way I sometimes looked at her. I will never do these things. Mm. Mm. And I could trace them all back to when I was about that age of four or five and my mom was having a really hard day, one of her hard days among many, and it wasn't her fault. It really wasn't. And I have nothing but love for her. And I knew in the moment that something was almost being played through her onto me and I could feel it and I felt that it wasn't clean and I didn't want it. And there was a part of me, even at that tender young age, that was able to rise up and say, no, not my story. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, we all were sitting there watching our parents, who were the kids of World War II children, um, manage their inability and unwillingness, really, to ask for what they wanted. So I can completely relate to this, and I remember many moments, now that you're saying this, of watching my mom or my dad, you know, have a conflict. Neither one of them are being met. Neither one of them are actually getting what they wanted in this moment. Oh my God. And I can't do a thing about it. And this hurts in my body. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. Because you love these people, you know, and yet sometimes they're failing you. And they're failing themselves. And there was this super powerful moment where I remember um, she was kind of dragging me towards the kitchen. And, uh, you know, please understand when I say all this, I, I truly harbor no ill will. Like she was screaming at me. And I hid in this little corner in the kitchen. And I said to myself, watch, there's something very important happening here you're safe, but watch. And I looked and as this was all unfolding, I had three really strong promises that came to me. The one of, I will never be this person that she is right now. Nothing in life will get me here. I refuse to let life turn me into this. So many other wonderful parts of her, right? So I don't mean to make it one dimensional, but I didn't want that. And I don't ever want my kid to feel like this. And then the third part was kind of funny. I had learned if you're happy and you know it in school. And I was like, okay, I'm going to change the channel on the TV station of my life right now. Mm. And I'm going to get to decide my reality no matter what's happening. I'm going to become outcome independent. And I didn't use those words, but that was essentially the choice I was making as a five-year-old. Now, you could call it dissociating, but I would say it was actually choosing to engage in a higher power. And I just started singing, if you're happy and you know it. And part of it was I enjoyed the irony. Part of it was I liked how much it flummoxed her. It felt like power. And it was my first experience of I could choose my own radio station. You know, and I was like, okay, so I will always be in control of how I am and I will always be outcome independent. And I grew up and I waited for a really long time till I had my own kids. And I thought that I had become this incredibly conscious person, which in many, many, many ways that I had. And I had also become a quite a controlled person. And so part of the reason I was able to be so conscious was because I was very consciously choosing what came into my life and what didn't. And then I had kids and kids are chaos. Kids are fucking chaos. And all the love in the world wasn't enough and all of my intentions and all of my promises. And I wound up yelling at my kids. Oh yeah. And I stood there as a grown up, yelling at my kids going, I have broken all three of my promises. And my children aren't even three. And that was it. I was like, no go. Not going to do it. I'm here. This is my life. These are my promises. And I'm going to make good on them. And I did. And then when I figured out how to do that, I started whispering to other parents, you know, hey, you can do this. And then I started helping. And then it became like 
fully my mission. Hmm. The program that I was just reading aloud, this transformation over six months, can you talk a little bit about this? Because I want our listener to understand what it is exactly that you're offering and how they can consider it if they need this. Yeah, I think it's so important that parents know that first of all, if things aren't the way that you want them to be, if you are screaming, I don't believe that you are a bad person because you're screaming at your kids. I think it's your vision. It's your highest self screaming at you to say you can do better, not in a shameful way, but like as a promise to say, hey, everything you believe in you that could be more right, you're right. It's true. And so having that goal in and of itself can just feel torturous if you know where you want to be, but you have no way to get there. So that's why I built like a very specific breadcrumb by breadcrumb way for parents to get there. And it's very, very um, specific. It's like a Lego manual. Every single step of it is exactly what you need to hear when you need to hear it. So you can completely from scratch build the life that you want to have. And it it's literally your life. Like it's not mine. I don't tell anybody how to live. You want to go to sleep? Great. You want to get the kid out of the room? Great. You know, whatever you're doing, I fully trust you. You know your life, you know your lineage, you know where you're going. I just help you clarify exactly that voice that's screaming inside of you that's waiting for you to fulfill your mission. I'm basically just taking my light and lighting your candle. And so wherever you want your family to go, I help you get extremely clear about that. So the reason it's six months is because it's not a quick fix. It's not a my answer for your answer. It's actually I help Mm. you hear yourself and that takes time. So in the first month, what we do is we get really clear. I sometimes call it your Marie Kondo month because it's like Mm. we get really clear about what you're keeping and what you're letting go and what you're bringing, like what's already in your closet. You know, what are you wearing without even realizing what you're wearing? You know, What is your silent promise? Like, not mine. You weren't there with me in that kitchen, you know, when I made those promises that day. But like, you know, where were you? What was your silent promise? Because I maintain every parent has these Mm. and that it's incredibly important to know, right? Anyway, uh, so then we go um, into the core beliefs and we say, what is it you believe about your children? Like this one, you know, never shares toys or this one is my good kid. And like, whether your core belief is quote unquote positive or negative, quote unquote, it doesn't matter. You're still wrapping somebody up in a box. You're still putting a ceiling on your possibilities and theirs. And it blinds you. And so we have to get really clear about it. Then we start actually understanding the neuroscience of connection and attachment and how you move into a person and connect with them deeply in a way that matters. Not like, I made all these lunches for you. I made all these things for you. Now go do this. But like, actually, I see you. I see your soul. I always say parents, we act like we're sandwich makers and we are, but we're also soul shapers. And when you start deeply understanding your job and deeply having reverence for the person that you are carrying, then you can begin to see them clearly and you start to understand oh, I keep telling this kid to move fast, but this is a child who wants to move slow. I could do this for the next 30 years or I could stop and learn. I could figure out why do they want to move slowly? What is it they're bringing to me? Where do I need to slow down? And where do we actually need to move quickly? And if we actually need to move quickly, how do we do it with a person who wants to move slowly instead of saying you should want to move quicker because you don't? Mm -hmm. You know, I wonder if we could just take this little rivulet for a moment and talk a little bit about how you teach parents to get down to their kid's eye level and really sink in. Yeah, it's my favorite thing. You know, it's so interesting, right? Because at the end of the day, we cannot change another human being. So we're shaping, but we can't change and we shouldn't. And they have a deep wisdom. And parents will often say to me, um, oh, my child is too young. 
to understand that. And I go, have you tried? (laughs) Have you actually asked them? Because if you ask a two-year-old in the right way, they will answer you. They will give you their manual. They will tell you, here is how to lead me. So the problem is we keep saying what we want. So like, you need to go to bed, right? And the child says, you know, I need another comforter or I need another water or, you know, I need whatever, you know, or I don't like the, it's, it's scary in here. And you say, no, it's time to go to bed. I already read three books to you. We're in trouble. This is going to escalate and depending on the family and the history and the patterns and the habits, you know, this could wind up in a three hour thing. This could wind up in a huge fight. This could wind up in a physical fight. You know, there's so many different places that can go. Or we could stop and say, I have a child who's telling me that on a neural level, this child is not feeling safe and ready to let go. What can I do about that? If I fully accept that truth and I'm not fighting that truth, now what could I do? And now roads open up for me. I could have deep, beautiful conversations about life and safety, not, you know, in big terms, but in little terms of like, which blanket do you like? You like the fuzzy? What does a fuzzy do for you? You like to feel your hand on it? Can I feel my hand on it? Oh, I see why you like that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I touch that one and I kind of feel a shiver. Do you feel a shiver? Oh, what's it like in your body? And now I'm connecting a child to their body. What is it like in your body when you feel safe? How do you know? Mm, What kinds of things make you feel safe? Yeah. Oh. Well, me being here, that's that's true. You're very smart. Yeah, that your brain is made to make you think that. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Mm. And what helps you feel safe when you're on your own? How does your body help you feel safe? And how close do you need to be? If I'm here, do you still feel me? If I leave a poem under your pillow, do you still feel me? How do you know? Yeah. And now we can have beautiful conversations that you're like, well, I'll have that conversation for 10 minutes. I just don't want to be like, go to bed. No, I already read the book. No, you said, you know what? Forget it. I'm No, I'm canceling your play date. I don't want to have that conversation. I hate myself. It's the worst. This is very helpful um, for... If you're listening and you're a parent of a young kid, this is pretty much the golden ticket. Slowing down your own mind enough to sit with your person and just really listen, really feel, ask leading questions about what they might be feeling, teach them how to feel their body. One thing I think I did well with Jonah, who's now almost 16, I would always ask him to you know, sort of vibe it out. Do you think this way or this way? This book or that book? This color or this color? So I started him pretty early, getting him kind of adjusted to making choices based on his intuitive hit. Yeah. Which led into the types of conversations that you are suggesting, which are just, they were always the best ones, you know. How do you feel? What, What does this do for you? What would you like? And it's not that you're, you know, if you're listening to us and you're thinking, oh, well, I'm not pandering to, to that kid. That kid is eight years old. That kid doesn't even know. You know, there's a certain level of needing to verify that sentiment because they're eight years old and they do know. And they've been around you for eight fucking years. Yeah. And they know exactly what's going on. They know exactly what they want. They know that they're not getting respect. They know that you don't respect yourself. They know that you and your partner, whomever is there, is, are not respecting each other. They know a lot more than you think. Yeah. And I want to talk about what you're talking about because it's so important. So let's talk about this. You know, we're giving an example of a three-year-old, but I want to talk about something else here, which is when we talk about this, right? Like it, sometimes parents will say, well, my child won't talk to me. Great. Well, let's start there. Why? Do you know? There's a reason. And it doesn't mean you're a bad person. 
It's just there may have been signals of if you talk, I'm not going to listen, or if you talk, I'm going to try to change your mind, or if you talk, I, I'm already overwhelmed, or I can't handle your real feelings because they're too upsetting and I love you too much. Like Whatever it is that your perception of what your job is as a parent, and our job is not to make our kids happy, in my opinion, right? That's actually like undoable. You You can't do that, in my opinion, right? You can't be responsible for somebody else's mental health you're going to scrub the pavement before every step they take in life. Like it's not possible. You know, our job is to make them, I think, capable, connected to themselves, clear seeing in mind and heart and soul and able to act for their benefit and everyone else's, right? Ultimately. And in order to do that, one of the things that we have to protect, we're looking at massive skyrocketing anxiety, suicide, drug addiction, massive. It was happening before the pandemic and now with the pandemic and now with war. You know, sometimes parents will say, my child is so anxious. And I say, of course they would be. My goodness, look at climate change. Look at what's happening in the world. Like it would be wrong if they weren't. And we still have to equip them and scale them and make them capable for everything that's happening in this world. And to me, when I look at that core source of pain, I think it comes down to this. We don't allow people to want. Very early on, we take people's wants, we shame them, we make them wrong, we tell them why they should want something else. We either punish them, bribe them, threaten them, cajole them, distract them out of their want instead of just going, huh, you want this. I want that. Hmm. Yeah, they don't meet yet, but I bet we're creative enough to figure it out. And I call this co-creating. We take somebody's want. We take our want. We have to know our want too, because that's, I think, the fear of it. I don't want to hear your want because I need to make sure my want's going to happen. So I'm just going to shut your want down. But when we shut a want down, a child has two options. They're either going to hate you or hate themselves for wanting. And either one of those is disastrous. So We have to stop doing this. We have to protect and make it safe for our children to want and then teach them, listen, the way you're getting your want met might be really shitty, right? I'm not going to let you hit your sister over the head with a book because you want the remote control, but you want that remote control. Okay. I'm there with you. Why? What do we do about it? What are your options? How do we get that? How do you earn that? Who do you need to be to make that happen? What do you need to give her to make that happen? What does she want? There's so much intelligence on the other side of the yes. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. These are really important points for parents, for all of us. It really comes down to great listening, as you said, clear seeing, creating a culture of respect in your house. Yeah. You know, if you're listening to this and you don't feel like you have that, The good news is you actually can create that and it shouldn't take too long, but it has to start somewhere. And uh, Abigail, I would love to talk to our listener who really is lost and doesn't know where to begin, doesn't know how to start creating that culture in their own home. Yes. Thank you. Because here's the thing, you know, I want to be honest about something. When I first started this, I was at the lowest point for me as a parent when I had my firstborn um, was born with multiple open heart surgeries he needed to have because he had a congenital heart defect. And we didn't know if he was going to make it. And uh, it put me into parenting from a, a place of not only having had childhood trauma, but now as a parent, my first experience of parenting was parental trauma and trauma for my child. And I didn't know how to handle any of this. And quickly, I had a second child. I was so in over my head. And my life looked nothing like you are hearing me say today. And it's so important to understand that. This is a continuum. It is a spectrum. It is a circle. It's a spiral. I will have days like last week, I had a moment where I totally lost it. So rare for me now. It's like maybe once a year, I was listening to your gorgeous, gorgeous podcast with Sam Lamott. And Um, I think of it like a a kind of sobriety. Mm. I had an addiction to my rage to, it wasn't like it felt good, but, but there would be moments where I was like, 
I'm allowed to do this because, right? There was still that right, place. Right. And it was years of work on myself to be able to go, there is nothing that allows me to do that because it's not about a shame. It's not about from the outside, I shouldn't do this. It's not even about my children. It's not like, oh, I shouldn't do this because it hurts my children. Sure. All of those things are fucking true. Just like you shouldn't smoke because nicotine is bad for you. Great. Not going to make you stop. You know what makes you stop? Your own relationship with yourself. A moral line in the sand that you draw for yourself, a spiritual line where you say, I don't want to be that person because that's not what I want to put in the world. It's not the legacy I want to leave. It's not who I intend to share on this earth. It's not what I want to do. Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? When it comes to a core level identity. Mm -hmm. And so... But the problem is, until I understood that, I would go to these parenting classes. I would like, you know, listen to, you know, podcasts or blogs or read books or go to parenting classes. And I would come home fucking furious, Elena. Literally, my husband was like, Are you ready to get dressed and go to Angry Mommy class? And he would put me in the car and we would drive. And I would go to these places and so funny. they would talk about, you know, oh, you can't hurt your child's neural network and they really, um, anything you say stays with them forever and you must always be kind. And I was like, fuck you. What if I'm raging? What if I'm pissed? What if my kid just smacked me in the face? Like, what the fuck do I do then? And so that was the place that I was at when I started this journey. Okay. And it's really important that we always remember, I will also always be in that place. Do you know there's a place in me where I can always spiral through and I touch it and I go, oh, right, ouch. Okay, that's why I don't live like that anymore, right? Because there are better ways. And I was able to take that rage and turn that rage into my righteous desire to have a better life for me and for my kids. And you build it little by little, right? So First, you look in your silent promises, you look at your core beliefs, you figure out how to actually deeply connect with your child. You learn that parenting is not about changing your child's behavior. It is about creating the brain in your child that will ultimately naturally result in that behavior. So you're not grafting a lemon onto an orange tree, you're planting a lemon seed. And so if you know, here are the things I want to build in this child, I see this child already being this. How can I co-create with this creature? How can I make sure I am benevolent? So you got to make sure you're cleaning yourself through this whole process too, right? That's why we start with all that work because you have to be clean. If you're going to get your hands on somebody, you better be clean, right? And so a lot of it is this constant cleansing ourselves, helping shape them, cleansing ourselves, helping shape them. And that's how you can ethically shape a child's behavior over time, and it it helps you rise. So you actually wind up liking yourself and being able to get different behavior. And I tell parents, you know, you aren't parenting the behavior, you're parenting the child. And the way you do that is amygdala to amygdala, your brain and your regulation to that child's brain and their regulation. And you become a genuine benevolent leader helping that child, placing limits where there need to be limits, not being afraid of limits because the child is going to have a tantrum. So the fuck what? You can be a benevolent leader. You can ride it out. You can show them that life isn't too scary to live. That's important, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm by Mm -hmm. your side and I believe in you. And you hold those limits very firm. I call it the MFA hug. You're giving the child tons and tons of warm love. And you're giving the child incredibly strong push and limits at the same time, especially for highly sensitive, strong will kids, because they need that. If they don't get either end of that, they flop out like a fish out of water and it's bad, you know? The real mastery, I think, is just being able to observe yourself. Yeah, it's huge. As a parent, see what your wounds are, see how you can manage them, get help for yourself, and then you can start to... Uh, stop sort of resenting everything that happens and everyone around you and start to just provide leadership in that household. Yes. Yeah. And how can you be a leader when you don't like yourself? You know, you're like fake leading. You're just taking power grabs, right? But if you don't love yourself, if you don't learn to like really get clean and be like, 
I understand that my child is anxious and refusing right now to show up for softball practice, but I also can see my child's soul and I know he or she is desperate to get on that field. Here's everything I know about their temperament. Here's everything I know about my leadership capabilities. Here's everything I know about how to set limits and how to help this child rise up to their best self. And now I can go forward and make that happen for them because I am their best friend and that means I'm going to have limits and that means I'm going to be their leader and that means I'm going to be listening to them and their servant as well. And all together, we get this done and that kid gets on that field. You know what I mean? I do. I've been there many times. Yeah. Don't want to go to practice. Okay. Yeah. But here are the consequences. Yeah. You know, your team isn't going to depend on you. Your coach isn't going to call on you. You know, these are all the very natural consequences of that choice. I stopped a few years ago getting, taking things personally, getting so personally invested, you know. Yeah. Really helps. Um, I wonder sometimes, my friend, if uh, our sort of, similar shared propensity toward rage is not some sort of lineage related generational thing having been basically two three generations away from the holocaust i don't know i think about this often yeah i have to say um i'm watching everything happening as we all are in the ukraine right now and you know all i keep thinking about isn't just what's happening to the people they are now. I keep thinking generation after generation after generation after generation. You know, this is at least seven generations of hurt right now. And, you know, I personally deeply feel the Holocaust in my own life. And I don't have a single person that I can point to that I know perished in that. Although given that my family is from Eastern Europe, half of them, the other half Moroccan and Italian, Um, I'm absolutely certain I have many relatives who perished and I myself have like weird memories. I don't know how the world works. You know, I don't know if there's more than one life that's beyond me to know, but I will tell you that I have like very sensory experiences of just what happened. It's in my body on a very cellular level and you know, whether that's somatic trauma work, right? That I'm just sort of remembering, right? That's been passed down. I have no idea why or how, but I can tell you that I feel it. And Mm. it does, I think, affect, for me, sometimes love has meant worry, right? So I love you and my love will be transmitted to you as worry for you, right? And so cleaning that up has been a big river, to unpollute for me, right? Believing in possibility. And isn't it funny that like, then of course I have this child who his condition's incompatible with life, but but go have him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and how perfect, how perfect. Because becoming a mother for me was my first act of deep faith. I see everything in this life and I see everything in this life that points towards death. And I see everything in this life that is so hard and so fucking ugly. And I am Mm. still going to take a step and believe that it is all possible to rise. Right. And I don't know why, but that faith keeps showing itself to me. And I keep being able to take the next step. And the bridge never gives out. And there are dark moments on the bridge where I think it's giving out. But at the end of the day, I'm always still able to stay afloat. And there's so much in all that. I don't know. How about for you? Well, I think in some respects, we're all carrying that trauma from World War II. Yeah. It's being revisited right now uh, at the risk of, you know, speaking my mind. I wonder why we aren't taking more steps as a country to stop this madman. I really do wonder. I listened to uh, Molly McHugh recently, and I read her work, and she makes sense to me. And I worry about the injury that we've sustained, not just as Jewish people, but as a world through World War II, under the hands of this one person, you know, who caused so much death and destruction. I wonder if we're not repeating history. 
Yeah. And I, I'm afraid of that. Yeah, I think... You know, and I do think it seeps into our behavior. Yeah, I think it is such a complicated thing, how you fight, you know, for good. Like, because that is a fight too. And I think that's the thing is there is a warrior side to us as parents and as humans that we like to think like, oh, there's this darker side and, and they fight, but we don't fight. No, we, we fucking fight. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's a fight. And if we're not fighting, that's a bit of a problem. How do you not turn that fight into rage? Like, How do you keep that fight clean? And it's a big question. It's a big question. But I do think that there is beauty in that fight. You know, that's why for me, loving parenting and and a loving world is not just like all the good stuff, you know? It's fierce. It's fierce. Like what we are being asked to do for our children, what our children are being asked to do in this world, and what's happening to all of us. I agree with you. When I'm talking with a parent about a bullying situation, I always explain it's not just the child that's being bullied that's hurt. The bully is hurt. Every child who witnesses it is hurt. Every child who doesn't stand up to say something out of fear is hurt. Everybody is hurt by that event. Everybody is developing world views and promises, silent promises for themselves. You know, um, I'll get out, but at what cost? You know, and what do you do? I'm, I'm also struck by like, well, here I am. What can I do? You know, I'm sending money. I'm looking into hosting organizations. What can I do being another person? Like, what do you do for someone who's going through cancer? What do you do for someone who's in the middle of a war? How do we each reach out into somebody else's life and help? And so for me, what I know is that the work I do, I do get to do that every day. I get to help break bonds of intergenerational trauma, help people stand up and literally hold back all the waves that were and alter all the waves that come after them. And I teach people how to stand in that nexus and tell a new story. And this is the place I fight, right? And I still want to fight other places too, but this is the fight that I fight every day. Do you feel, have you ever um, considered the fact that the fight, quote unquote, maybe doesn't need to be quite so much of a fight and could be, I don't know, maybe be something softer. I think about this all the time, too, when I fall into that um, morass of conflict, you know, perceived conflict. Mm. Such a good question. Um, I don't feel, I think the word fight, it's like I need a new word, like how there's like, you know, so many words for snow. The fight doesn't feel conflict to me. It feels like um, joyous, if that makes sense. It feels expansive. Mm. When I say fight in that context, to me, it feels light-filled, expansive. It encompasses even the other person's wants. It's not fight against. It's like fight with for. So for me, I don't do well with conflict. (laughs) It's Mm -hmm. not an energy that I can handle well, if that makes sense. It it gets me very scrambled. I think the fight for is important. Right. It's a fight with for. So Mm -hmm. it's not a fight against. Yeah, I get that now. That makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, can. I wonder if there is another word for it. Yeah, what would be that word? <laughs> Rooting for, mm-hmm. you know, aiming at, mission-based, I don't know. Yeah. I would love to know, lastly, what um, what is sort of inspiring you the most right now in your own personal work and in your professional work? Mm. It has to be the parents that I work with, um, you know, I get love letters multiple times a day, um, at least multiple times a week. And it's people who are talking about change and the possibility of change. 
it's so funny, you know, when you talk even about the Holocaust, right? Something that upsets me is stagnancy. I get afraid when things are stagnant. And I think that goes back to that time a little bit. I don't like the feeling of being trapped. Mm. I mean, maybe that's just a human feeling, but for me, it has this resonance of a bit of that time, of that energy. And I like to know that I could always get out. (laughs) I like to know that change is possible. I don't want anyone, anything, any ideology, anything to trap me. Okay. And I think that was one of the things that was so hard for me when I first had children was I felt deeply trapped. I loved them. And yet uh, it was the experience of parenting them felt very entrapping because of who I was being, right? And their behavior. I couldn't figure out how to manage those two things. So when I get letters from families that say, you know, I can't believe what happened today. Every day, this has always looked you know, like this. And today I did what you said. And all of a sudden, all these things were possible. You know, my child is suddenly eating. My child is going to the bathroom. My child doesn't have anxiety in the same way anymore. My child, you know, signed up for the basketball team. My child, you know, um, now goes to bed and feels completely safe. These kinds of little small things, or I got a phone call from my mother and for the first time I felt love instead of rage. I felt forgiveness. I felt compassion, right? Um, you know, my child slapped me and by the end of the evening, we were having a fantastic card game and they apologized deeply and, you know, we cuddled in bed and, you know, he told me all of the things that have been really hard for him lately. You know, whereas before that would have wound up being, you know, me grounding them and, you know, screaming and taking away, you know, their friendships. And when at the end of the day, it was their friendships that they were struggling with, like how much harm could I have done? without knowing, right? right? right and right, so right. these kinds of things where I get to feel like I'm actually able to create different experiences for people on a daily basis that open up, those are ripples, you know, like that one conversation with that teenager leads to so many more, it leads to possibly a child who was going to make a really bad choice a month from now who all of a sudden decides to share that with their parent and makes a different choice. You know what I mean? Mm, Totally. And so I'm deeply aware for me that I'm helping people reauthor their lives and reauthor that trajectory of their generation as it relates to generations prior. And so that inspires me. Those letters, those little notes I get, you know, whether it's comments in the course or actual emails, they just sit down to write me or a mom who wrote saying, um, oh, you know, I've started woodworking now. I've always wanted to be a woodworker, but I never believed in myself. And, Mm. you know, I grew up in a family where we had a lot of scarcity and, you know, now I just thought I want to work with wood and I, I bought a tool and now I have seven tools and three saws and watch me. Here's a video of me woodworking. And, you know, God, like that brings me joy. Yeah. You know? That's beautiful. So that's real, real change yeah. on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. That's very good. And personally? What inspires me personally? Um, so I have a really hard time working out. Exercise is really difficult for me. Um, it feels like time, it feels um maybe self indulgent. I have all these stories from my own past of not being able to do, um, you know, like dodgeball and Red Rover as a child, like of um, PE being like a traumatic experience in such a way that it disconnected me from my own ability to exercise my own body. And it's been a long relationship of healing. You know, I used to do yoga for many years, but my body isn't quite feeling like it wants to do yoga in the same way anymore. But I kept feeling um, getting called to do Pilates. And I actually wound up starting a Pilates practice. And I am so personally (laughs) inspired by that little machine. (laughs) I love it. It's like it can do so many things and I can do so many things with it. And we're having a really interesting conversation. And every time that I go and I do it, I feel like I get to unlock part of my own story and take back my own power 
in a conversation with this very simple, healing, repetitive motion that um, somehow rocks my world and it inspires me. <sighs> that makes me happy. Which, uh, are you working on the Cadillac, the Reformer, or the little Wanda chair? It is the Reformer. Nice. Beautiful. Good for you. Your body, you know, as we get older, this could be a whole nother podcast, but as we get older, your body needs you to actually build muscle. Yes. Dearly. Yeah. So that's great for you. Good. Um, it has been a joy to have you and to have this very real, raw conversation. I want to thank you for your time and for your commitment to the parents. And for our listener, lastly, where shall they find you? You can find me at motherflippingawesome.com. Motherflippingawesome.com. Yep. Dang. Yeah. So good. It's so good. And there is everything, your course, every podcast, all that stuff. Yes. Exactly, okay. exactly. And cool. there's even a Mother Flipping Awesome app if they want to download that. And wow. I just want to What does the app do? The app gives you access to the podcasts and also I sometimes see. we'll run a free community class there and gives you a bunch of mind flips and all sorts of ways to get started at wondering what it would be like to think differently in the heat of the moment of parenting. So Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And I just thank want to you. say thank you to you because I am so just moved by your questioning and your wondering about people, about experiences, about life, about um, just being present with difficulty, with discomfort. I'm very inspired by you personally mm. and I'm very thank grateful you. to you thank you I feel that I receive it and I appreciate it very much thank you more soon uh, I will keep tracking you my dear I'm very proud of you and I'm proud to be in this with you thank you 